For it TV, the world is thinking. Well, so in the case of Wag Dodge or Captain Sullenberger, what you see in the brain is the prefrontal cortex turns on. This is a uniquely human brain area. It's greatly enlarged during human evolution, and it allows us to kind of rebut our emotions, to think through fear and make sure our fear doesn't turn into panic. So, you know, everyone on the U.S. Airways flight is terrified, everyone's scared, and yet because Captain Sullenberger has this prefrontal cortex and because he's practiced thinking through fear, and pilots call this deliberate calm because staying calm requires deliberate effort, he was able to make a decision based on the facts, based on his altitude and airspeed, based on how far away Teterboro, New Jersey is, stuff like that. So the prefrontal cortex is what allows you to be rational to make these considered deliberate decisions. Now, in in terms of why sometimes the prefrontal cortex can backfire, this gets back to the sheer computational limitations of the prefrontal cortex. It's a magnificent piece of machinery. It's what allows Wag Dodge to invent the escape fire, and yet it can only handle about seven pieces of information, plus or minus two at any given moment. You give it more than that, and you start to short-circuit it. So That's one of why the too many cereal... Decisions. Yes, ex exactly. Why, why, why when there are 20 different kinds of Cheerios, why can't I can't make up my mind? And yeah. so one of the experiments I talk about in the book um, was done by a Stanford psychology professor who he had two groups of students. And it's important to note at the outset that the prefrontal cortex doesn't just keep stuff in working memory or allow us to invent you know, new ways to escape fire. It's also important for stuff like self-control, willpower, delayed gratification. So it's got it's to do a lot of stuff. You know, there's a heavy burden for this brain area. So back to the psychology experiment, he had two groups of students. One group had to remember a two-digit random number. The other group had to remember a seven-digit random number. He told the students this was a test of long-term memory, but he was lying. He then marched the students down the hall where they had a choice of fruit salad, the responsible option, or a gooey, rich slice of chocolate cake. What he found was that the students given seven digits to remember were almost twice as likely to choose chocolate cake as a student's given two digits. And that's simply because all it took was five extra numbers to, in a sense, short circuit the prefrontal cortex, to overwhelm it. So there wasn't enough processing power left over to actually resist the slice of chocolate cake. And I think that illustrates <laughs> ju just, ju just how bounded this, this bit of brain is. Um, and why sometimes, in some circumstances, it can actually lead us astray. So I'll give you another example of, of when it can be wise to, I think, trust your emotional brain. This is an experiment done by a neuroscientist named Antonio Damasio. It's known as the Iowa Gambling Task. And the experiment goes like this. There are four decks of cards. Each deck, two decks are much better than the others. But each deck, you pick up a card, and it'll say, you won $75, or you lost $200, or you, know, you won $10, and so on. And so the job of these subjects in the experiment is to pick up decks from these cards until they figure out which decks are the best. And so when you give people these four decks of cards, what you find is that it takes about 50 to 60 cards before people can explain why one deck is better than the other. You have to draw a lot of cards. Logic is slow. It takes a while to accumulate enough evidence in order to realize that one deck is the best and then the three decks aren't so good. However, when you hook up people's hands to a machine that measures the electrical skin conductance, so that measures anxiety, stress, nervousness, what you find is that their hands start to get nervous, their hands start to get sweaty whenever they reach for the bad decks of cards after only six or seven cards. So in a sense, their hand, their emotional brain, knows much more than they know. It's, it's responding to facts. It's taking in information much quicker than their rational brain is. So, so that's just a small example in the book. I talk about that in terms of professional poker players and mm -hmm. how poker players have learned, you know, they have to really practice listening and learning and eavesdropping on their emotional brain but how really what they're picking up on is, is those very subtle signals, those sweaty palms that allow them to act on information they may, they may have no conscious awareness of.